and welcome to the Easter edition of Gossip Before Bed. And look, I've done a little display. I mean, it's a little bit lame, but never mind. I've got a gorgeous card from my mum that she made us or for our family and my little bunny. And look at this. See this little gold bucket of chocolate eggs? They're for you. My virtual Easter present to you. And I'm going to eat them all for you so that you can enjoy them virtually. Aren't I kind? Aren't I nice? And I'll really enjoy that. Actually, the boys have been walking past just from yesterday. I set this up yesterday and they've been looking in the door of my office and they're saying, Mom, can we have a chocolate egg? And I said, nope. They're for gossip before bed. You cannot touch. You'll ruin my display. Though I admit, while I've been in here, had quite a few. They've gone down quite a bit since yesterday. <laughs> anyway, we'll say sip, sip. Tea again, I'm so predictable, so boring. I've got my nurse's pajamas on. <laughs> because a lot of comments were made the last time that I wore these PJs and they said, you look just like a nurse. And then I looked up UK nurses uniforms and they are, they're navy with the white sort of piping. So that's hilarious. In Australia, we have very different uniforms to this. So it never even occurred to me. And one lady said, I've got those pajamas. Now these are quite posh designer brand, but I got them off the bargain rack at TJ Maxx. So I was quite impressed to hear that she paid full price. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love it when it's confirmed that you get a bargain? I would love to tell you the designer, but I'd have to rip the top off, have a look. I, mean, I don't want to scare you. I don't want to upset you. <laughs> not on Easter. So that was fun. That was really fun. Actually, I'm not plugging TJ Maxx because they don't sponsor me. But if you want good jammies, um, they often have a lot of fantastic sort of designer brand pajamas and um, you can pick them up for around $29.99 or something. Oh, now I've given it away. I'm going to have to find somewhere else to get all my pajamas, aren't I? All the good ones will go. Great, Shauna. Brilliant. Never mind. So how have you been going? I'm about to put my glasses on because I'm going to read something to you that I've got saved on my phone. But how have you been coping with everything? It's just been such a barrage, hasn't it? Such a barrage of negativity and concerning news and oh, and the, the just, oh, just last night, the uh, bridge falling down, the Baltimore Bridge, when that cargo ship banged into it. Oh, gee, it's just so sad. You know, the thought I immediately had, because I immediately think whenever I see any disaster or anything that could possibly befall my family, I always think, right, from now on, whenever we go across a bridge that's over water, I'm going to wind down the windows so that if that ever happened to me and we fell into the drink, we'd be able to get out once the car fully submerged and it stopped, the water stopped rushing in, we could at least get out of the car and swim up to the surface. That was my thinking. So I went out after I saw that, I went out to see the guys and I said, right, from now on, before you cross the bridge over water, you must wind down all the electric windows. So <laughs> that is the edict that I have put out across my family. I've already told them that in relation to floods. I mean, you should never drive through flood water. But if there's no water over the road and you are just making your way home, but you have to go through causeways that could be subject to flash flooding, uh, but there's no water, right? Don't, I've told them never go through water. Um, I said, always wind down your window. Always wind down your window when you're going through, when there's a lot of rain, chance of flash, flash flooding. Um, always wind down your window because I still remember those scenes of those dreadful floods we had and um, cars were swept off. I think it was Grantham, wasn't it? And cars were actually swept off the road. And I'll never forget seeing the, the footage of the guy in the van. He had his head sort of on the dash and I think he was you know, crying. I think he was really upset trying to work out what he could do because he couldn't get his windows down and the van was just floating down the river. And I mean, that would be such a terrifying situation. So I say to everyone, <laughs> If you're going to be in danger of being swept off the road with any water at any point, please wind down your windows and let the rain come in on you. That's my advice anyway, because it's, I think it's virtually impossible 
to um, smash a window these days. This is going off track a little bit, isn't it? How do we get onto this? I wanted to get on to the fact that I've been really fascinated to see how the media are trying to rewrite the narrative of the pylon on Catherine. I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to get into it in a dark sort of serious way. But they're basically blaming it on the public. They're saying that the public caused it and the public had a thirst to know. And the Well, no, <laughs> no one I knew in my immediate circle, I bet in your immediate circle, was wanting to know. We all knew. We all knew where she was, she said. So, you know, they're trying to say that, no, no, this was definitely a story, a story driven by media and um, online cesspools and, yeah, so trying to blame the public thirst for it. I don't think that's fair at all. One of the nice stories that I really loved and embraced through sort of the upset was a story by Roy and Nicker in the Times and it was about Charles and Catherine and I'm just going to read you the headline because I just think it's so cute. I know she's actually known for uh, writing very favourable Meghan Markle articles. I've never actually read any of her favourable Meghan Markle articles but I love her more recent articles because they seem to be very supportive and she seems to be getting the inside track. She seems to be getting the story now. And the headline was the hospital heart to hearts that brought Kate and King even closer. Now, this is the line I love. This is the subheading. Charles toddled from his hospital bed to comfort the Princess of Wales as both recovered from surgery in the London clinic. Now, it's the use of toddled that <laughs> convinces me that this really happened and that this was reported to her. Um, I don't know who by, but toddled is so real because whenever you see a man past a certain age in their dressing gown they definitely toddle they don't stride they toddle <laughs> in their slippers so I just thought that was really really cute and also this one paragraph I thought was just lovely and it sort of sets the scene for us having a good time tonight a source close to Charles said the king has always had a close, warm and unique relationship with the princess. She has a great love and respect for him and his position. When they were in hospital together, there was a lot of toddling down the corridor to spend time with her. He's been encouraging and supporting her throughout. So that's lovely and I can believe that and that sounds like a loving family rallying around each other. So, you know, we've got to celebrate the good bits, don't we? Got to celebrate the good bits. So sip. So I've also got amazing comments this week, really interesting comments, not only from the last Gossip Before Bed, but also under the book videos. And I waited, I didn't record the book videos, I waited until everyone had had a chance to comment under the last lot, because I intend to sort of do a little bit of a sharing of comments at the end of each book video now, because a lot of the comments are brilliant. And a lot of people have actually met the people that are being, you know, spoken about in these books. I mean, one lady in the uh, Princess Margaret, after the Princess Margaret chapter in Kitty Kelly's The Royals, she actually had dinner with Roddy Llewellyn, who, of course, was Princess Margaret's squeeze in the later years of her life that she used to run off to Mystique with and have romantic holidays. And this lady actually had a dinner with Roddy Llewellyn and said he was, you know, very charming. I've heard that he's very charming. So it's going to be such fun to share all these comments because it's it it really impacts you when you know the person that's writing the comment has actually sort of met the people that you're discussing. It just, ah. Oh blows my mind, blows my mind. I've also had, like I said, lots of great comments from Gossip Before Bed last week and I'm going to read you out some funny ones and I'm also just going to read out some really interesting ones. This is from user TT3JB2DA, you know, one of those ones, not a proper name. You probably know this, but Meghan has literally ripped off the Duchy of Cornwall's high grove theme with her brand, with the American Riviera Orchard brand. They even have a Royal High Grove Orchard Room, which is aptly named because it overlooks the orchard. That makes sense. 
In the shop there and online, you can purchase honey, wines, candles, crockery, tea towels. They do guided tours of the vast gardens. Well, I guess Megsy Baby can't compete with that. I wonder whether she would do a tour of her Olive Garden mansion. Maybe they could serve some pasta. Maybe they could get Olive Garden to come in and do sort of like a franchise effort. You know, al fresco out in their garden. And then she could do a tour of the rescue chickens and everything in her ball gown, in her Carolina Herrera ball gown, the black one. She, I mean, she, she looks like she's trying to get sort of bang for a buck out of that one because I think that was the one that was in <laughs> the sepia video that was plugging American Riviera Orchard. It did look rather creepy. I actually did a post on... Um, X, I was going to say Twitter again. And I was saying that I got woman in black vibes. You know, that really creepy, scary movie. Well, it just looked like woman in black, like someone appearing at the end of this <laughs> hall. It looked quite strange. You know, I'm not sure that black is really the image she's after. She needed a, a beige ball gown. Anyway, she could take tours in her ball gown. Actually, she could do a full woman in black sort of ghost tour in melodrama Sito and sort of take everyone up that hall and it could all be lit with candles and she could hold a torch underneath her chin. Follow me. Follow me to the orchard. <laughs> oh, that's just mean. But she could. She could do tours. I mean, I think they're going to have to try and rake up some interest some way. Um, but it was funny. It did sort of smack of woman in black. Then this lady goes on saying that a jar of 200 grams honey from the High Grove shop sells for £7.95, which she's saying is very affordable. <laughs> Sounds a bit expensive to me. But anyway, with international deliveries and with all money made going to the King's Trust charities. So why would anyone want to purchase from Megan when you can get it from High Grove with the royal standard stamped on it and help charity? Well, I think that someone at Highgrove might have been going t -t 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 in the comments <laughs> because that was a plug. That was an advertorial, but it does make a lot of sense. I mean, if it does go to charity, then why would you purchase from American Riviera Orchard that goes to, or A-R-O? Oh, last gossip, I said something else, didn't I? I said O-R-O, Oro, and it's Arrow. And people are saying that it's an acronym for uh, another ripoff. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, I've got a freckle story. We're on a bit of a roll. We're on a bit of theme with these freckle stories. And um, this is, oh, this is from a gentleman that has been with me from the very beginning. Hi, Ian. Freckle stories are hysterical. I was cursed with freckles all my life until this fabulous Jamaican lady asked why I never took my shirt off at the beach. I told her and she said in the most gorgeous Jamaican accent, she told me I should be proud of my angel kisses. Since then, I am. <laughs> you should be proud of your angel kisses. Definitely, definitely. Oh, it's funny. My sister rang when I was at my mum's the other day and we were laughing about the fact that I, you know, dogged in my brother about saying that a car farted in my face for my freckle story. And then my mum actually reminded her that she told me when I was littler that I was adopted. And not only that, she told me that I was in the Pampers Nappy commercial. Now, for the Americans, diapers the Pampers nappy commercial in Australia. There was a Pampers ad where a big chunky sort of happy baby was sort of <laughs> plopped on the top of a pile of nappies. And my sister, she started it, she's to blame, but my brother joined in, convinced me that mum and dad, had they said in their words, they sold me <laughs> to the Pampers ad and, um, you know, and that I was the Pampers baby. Now, I was old enough to understand it and to be feel embarrassment, horror and <laughs> be concerned. So I remember running into my mum and saying, it was it true that I was in the Pampers commercial? Well, of course, mum just started laughing. So then, but then, then 
I came out and said, no, I wasn't, you know, because mum told me I wasn't in the Pam's commercial. And then, you know what they said? They said, oh, of course she'd say that. Of course she'd deny it. You can't believe that, you know, she, that you can't believe the denial. Then, then they convinced me that I was adopted and they were saying, see, you don't look like any of us, which I did look like them. Aren't they awful? Big brother, big sister. Yeah, you're being outed now on a global platform. <laughs> no, they were very good, brother and sister, actually. I was very lucky. They were very, very lovely and um, loving. Lots of hugs. Loved mucking around with my big brother. We used to get up to all sorts of things around the neighbourhood. We used to make lots of cubby houses and we used to go riding on our bikes. And we had this massive oak tree near our house and it was just the best, best to climb because it had a branch you could hold on to and then swing your legs up on this huge broad branch. And the branch was so broad that you could lie there in comfort. And there would be like, oh, I think there was many broad sort of branches. So my brother would go up to a higher one and I'd be on the lower one. And then there'd be a big center part of this gorgeous oak tree that I believe is still there, which would be almost like a little picnic area. And we used to pick sour grass. I mean, imagine all the dog pee on this sour grass. And we used to get the sour grass and then go up and sit in the oak tree and look at everyone coming and going and chew on our sour grass, which probably had a lot of dog pee on it. I love sour grass. That's what we call it in Australia. Let me know uh, what you may have called it in other countries, but we called it sour grass. It used to grow, you know, on the side of the road. And we, I used to even pick it on the way to the school bus and chew on the sour grass. I love sour grass. It was probably very good for me. Now, another comment came from a lady where we were talking about last week, I was telling you about Ding Dong Dandy. And also we got the comment about the lady with the Barbie with the bendy knees. And this lady actually commented about her very special uh, childhood toy. And it was really heartwarming and a lot of you liked it. And so that made me see it. So I'm going to share it. I am 69 in the US and I had my first stuffed animal. I loved elephants and it was a stuffed elephant. When I was three and my family went to Florida, it was left behind in a motel. My mother wrote to every place we stayed at and a housekeeper found it, held onto it and mailed it to me. Every time I look at that stuffed elephant, I think of my mother having written to every place and it was returned. So touching and a great memory of an awesome mum. Well, she was an awesome mum. That's the thing. Things were a bit tougher in those days, weren't they? I mean, you had to actually sit down and write letters and then go and post them. So that was dedicated and you got your elephant back. I love happy endings. Let's sip to the elephant coming back. Sip. Okay, more great comments. There's just so many really great comments. Oh, this was funny. This was a one line sort of take, satirical take on uh, Megan's appearance at South by Southwest where she repeated the Procter Gamble story and also the launch of ARO. And this was clever, I thought. Montecito residents are fighting greasy pots and pans across American Riviera. (laughs) <laughs> I thought that was clever. And that was from, from Wandering Early. Wandering Early. Yeah, very clever. Very clever. I should get you to write some of my snarky snippets. Okay. Oh, and another thing just under that. Oh, I've done it again. God, I'm hopeless. You know, me and technology. Let's get rid of that. Okay. Um, another one under that was Roland Collins 7386 said, When Sophie, the Duchess of Edinburgh, first went out with Prince Edward, she was hounded a lot by the media. And I actually, that prompted me to look it up and, gee, she was. She was. She was still working and they were. See, look, I hate to talk about Meghan Markle on the Gossip Before Bed, but I just have to make this point. When you look at Sophie, when you look at Sarah, when you look at Diana, they were chased. They were hounded. There were packs 
There, I mean, I know Meghan Markle and Harry tried to pretend there were packs, but they were at a Harry Potter premiere and they were at a, a court thing for that Katie page three girl, Katie Price. They just ripped off camera packs and put them into their documentary and Americans fell for it. Not, not the people that watch this show. <laughs> they don't fall for it, I know. But a lot of Americans... Um, you know, the sort of people that watch The View, they fell for it hook, line and sinker and it was all fake because those tabloid UK press packs, they don't exist. After Diana's death, they're not allowed to do that. And the people that took the grainy photos of Catherine in the car and everything, that was an American tabloid. That was TMZ. They did that. They came across and did that. It wasn't UK. I'm not defending UK tabloids. Well, it sounds like I am. <laughs> I'm not. I'm a no great fan of UK tabloids. But um, it's sort of a little unfair because it's not really true. <laughs> and if you look back through, I've actually been looking back through and I've been checking the headlines and the articles on Meghan Markle when she was in the UK. And other than a few that were questionable, and no doubt they were, Really, the coverage was quite positive from the UK newspapers. There were moments, but generally it was just reporting her acting rather badly, you know, uh, reports of her treating her staff badly and staff had leaked it, you know, stuff like that. But it wasn't, um, they didn't really pay a lot of attention to her. There was a lot of positive press around her in her early pregnancy and stuff. So I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. You know, we could debate all this ad nauseum, couldn't we? Now, another comment. Now, this is funny because, and I've got to read this out because a lot of people said this under the last gossip. And when I was talking about cooking shows, and I've got to tell you something about a really great cooking show I saw it last night. Now, this is uh, Lynn Wen 10. Back in the 60s and 70s in the UK, we had this grand TV chef called Fanny Craddock. She was always dressed up to the nines and she was ter terrifyingly patronising. Her husband, Johnny, was there helping her. He wore a moniker and liked a drink or two or three. <laughs> so Megan and Harry could be the new Fanny and Johnny. Well, of course, that made me go and look it up. And she was terrifying and she had these unusual eyebrows these sort of drawn on eyebrows that were seemed a little too high for her face they were sort of drawn on they seemed to be drawn on in the wrong position to me anyway and she was very funny I mean she even had a young sort of apprentice chef I watched one where she was making a Christmas dinner and she had this young apprentice chef and and oh no no it was pork crackling pork crackling might have been for Christmas dinner. Anyway, she's cutting off this pork crackling and she allowed this sort of apprentice chef to taste a little bit of it. And then she gave a little bit more. And then she said, okay, off you go. Take it off you go. <laughs> oh, she was very abrupt, very abrupt, very controlling, very controlling. So yes, it couldn't be that Megan's <laughs> cooking show could be very a la Fanny Craddock. I'll just type it into Google and have a look. It's hilarious. You'll love it. It's so funny. And because I looked at that Fanny Craddock video, YouTube actually sort of uh, brought up in my recommended a new Jamie Oliver series. And it's one, I don't know if it's new, but it was new to me, One Pan Wonders. And I looked at it. Oh, my goodness me. You have to watch it. You have to watch it. He blew my mind because he made a pasta dish in one pan. So you're literally just washing up one pan. And just quickly, it was smoky bacon and oil and then fresh rosemary. I've got so much fresh rosemary out in my herb garden. It's like a tree. And uh, just button mushrooms, nothing, you know, overly special, all chopped up, chucked in the pan, mushrooms uh, cooking in the smoky bacon oil and oil. And then this blew my mind. Now, I bet you all know this because I'm really naive when it comes to cooking. Fresh lasagna sheets cut into like centimetre strips and just chucked in the pan and then tossed through the smoky bacon. Then he got boiling water from the kettle and just put the water so it just sat over the pasta and the bacon and the whatever. Then... He whipped up an egg and put a heap of parmesan, fresh parmesan, grated into the egg, whipped that up, 
Chalk the pan off the heat so that the egg wouldn't cook. Let it cool down, then flipped this sort of egg parmesan mixture through all the pasta, returned it to the heat on a low heat and just sort of melded all those flavours together and then served it up. One pan and a cutting board. And it looked amazing. But the thing that blew my mind was the fresh lasagna used as fresh pasta just cut into strips. Blew my mind right there. Now you're all looking at this and going, oh, Shauna, I've been doing that for years. <laughs> oh, let's sip to me not knowing how to cook. Sip. So anyway, I was impressed. Then, and then one more thing, I won't bore you, I won't bore you, but you've got to go and see it. Actually, I'll put a link down below. Um, the other thing was a fish pie in a pan and it was done with phyllo pastry and salmon and prawns and couscous and all these herbs and dill and oh, lemon and oh gosh, it was so yummy and so easy. So, And particularly people that live alone, all of these dishes you could do in a pan to suit your size or you could do it like double, well, to fit the pan, fit the pan, eat half one day, chuck the rest in your fridge and microwave it for the second day. I don't recommend doing that beyond the second day. Don't do that. I don't want to make you sick. <laughs> but it would be perfect and it was so easy. Who doesn't love cooking in one pan anyway enough? He should pay me for that. That was an ad. But I was genuinely so impressed. Uh, another one about the lighthouse. Everyone loved the lighthouse story and I did put a link to a doco in the description of last week's gossip which actually showed you meeting that lighthouse keeper and they gave him a photo of him standing at the door before the wave came around. And one thing I realised was I was describing it like I saw it as a film. I didn't see it as a film. What I saw it was was the original photographer did it as a time lapse so what I was getting was k -k 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 a time lapse of the photos and I remembered it as if I'd seen a film, but it wasn't a film. But that doco was amazing. I mean, the guy wasn't very sort of, um, he wasn't very effusive when he was given the photo of himself on the, you know, by the photographer, a signed huge photograph, um, you know. But they said in the documentary that he wasn't very, um, he didn't sort of display his emotions. So that was a little disappointing because, you know me, I'm always like, oh, 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 all over the top. So when people don't show their emotions, I always feel like giving them a poke, saying, come on, show you're happy. <laughs> anyway, you're in good company. This is from Jenny Annie 5140. You're in good company with Princess Anne. She has a lighthouse obsession and I believe she's visited all UK lighthouses. She was also taking detours while abroad to take in a lighthouse or two. Well, good on you, Princess Anne. I would love to come with you um, at a future date. If you'd like an Aussie companion, I'll be guaranteed to be interested and effusive <laughs> around lighthouses. Just, you know, ring me up. I'll come. This is from Kako, Kako, Kaku 2003. Oh, the bending legs Barbie. I got a Barbie doll with bending legs for my birthday, lucky girl, when I was about eight. I was so excited and I was allowed to take her to school that day. I took Ding Dong Dandy to my school that day. On the way from the bus to my school, she fell out of the box, so brand new, I wanted to take her in the box. When I discovered it, I was devastated. However, another little girl at school had found her and was overjoyed to have this Barbie. Oh, that would be my worst nightmare. Worst nightmare. The nuns wouldn't take it off her and, and give it back to me. They told my mother they would buy me another one, but I wanted my Barbie. Looking back, this other little one must have had something going on in her life that prompted the nuns to do this, but at the time I was so upset. I hope Camilla keeps her safely under her arm and does not transport it in a box. Yes, indeed. Um, that was obviously the wrong thing to do. The, the nun should have uh, said to the girl, well, that's not yours, so we must give it back to the rightful owner, but we will buy you another one. Wouldn't you think, oh, unless the girl that found it was saying that it was one of the, you know, Catholic saints that actually led her to the bendy Barbie. If she spun that to the nuns, 
the nuns wouldn't take it off her because they would think it was ordained. <laughs> so Francis Assisi is giving you a bendy leg barbie. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't mean to insult the Catholics uh, out there. I'm not Catholic myself, but my husband is. And uh, it's just a giggle, just a giggle. But that could have been the reason why the nun didn't want to take it off her. They might have thought it was, you know, a, a Barbie, bendy Barbie miracle. Um, so from the real Gigi, now this vindicated my mistake. There was a Queen Victoria doll's house. So I could have got away with it. I could have not admitted my mistake and actually said, well, no, I was referring to the Queen Victoria doll's house. But I think I mentioned the little baby book, so that gave it away that it was the Queen Mary one. So I couldn't get away with it. But it's at Kensington Palace now. Queen Mary's doll's house has little miniature books and miniature everything. Those books are really printed books. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's just amazing. So the other thing I want to say, now this is bitchy, so we'll prepare, we'll prepare for bitchy with a sip, sip. Prince Harry actually reached out to Prince William, as we know, blah, 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 all the news, you know, reached out privately, yet we all heard about it, you know, it was all over the news. But one thing that amused me was, and I think I believe it because I want to believe it, is that he sent a text directly to William and William didn't respond. He got staff to respond quite formally to this text. That's Well, that's the heads up anyway. And I thought, serves you bloody right, you know. I just, I thought that was poetic justice. I really did. But I actually kept um, one of the things, um, yeah, so... It was a Royal commentator, Sarah Louis Robinson, on Friday um, saying that uh, Harry reached out to his brother last night and there have been some text messages, some exchanges, and the fact that this has happened shows that there could be now maybe a thawing and a bit of an olive branch between the two families. Rubbish, absolute rubbish, because quite quickly after that, uh, palace sources said that, that yes, the Duke of Sass was replied to, but um, no, it was a formal sort of aid reply. So there you go. So I <laughs> just had to correct that, just had to correct that. Oh, in my last psychic snippet, I said uh, Prince of Wales, and in my script I had spell, spell, and I just, when I was recording it, I hopped over my own direction and I meant to spell W-A-I-L-S, and I didn't. So, of course, it came across as Prince of Wales. And when someone called me out on it initially, I thought, oh, did, like I couldn't remember because once I've sort of written and recorded a script, I pretty much wipe them out of my brain and I'm on to the next one. I've got them all saved, though. I might do a book one day. And um, and I, th I said, oh, did I? Oh, oh, that's weird. I've made a mistake. And then I went, but that doesn't you know, it doesn't seem like me. I'm so perfect. So I went back and checked the script and I had in brackets spell. So I did mean to say Prince of Wales. Oh, gosh, I'm glowing again. I'm glowing again. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going to take a break and I'm just going to get my little fan. It's not even hot today. I must get excited when I do gossip before beds. Cut. Look at my fan. <laughs> Can you hear that over the microphone? Ah, it's lovely. It's lovely. Don't worry, I am getting air conditioning. I'm just waiting to winter because it's cheaper if you get it in winter. <laughs> ah, ah, I must be still going through that time of life. I thought I was past all that. Having a hot flush, love. Never mind. But can you hear that through the microphone? Because it's, oh, it's a lovely little thing. Oh, it's just great. So if you can hear the hum, I apologise, but I'm going to keep that on because it's, do I look like Beyonce? with the hair blowing. <laughs> I could turn it up, then my hair would blow. I'd look really glamorous then. So what else have I saved on my on my Gossip Before Bed album? Um, oh, look, I've got to get off the harkles. It's hilarious because <laughs> I've saved. <laughs> I've saved the Carolina Herrera coat dress thing that, Mega recently wore to the art gallery because you know what it reminded me of? 
it reminded me of the brunch coats that my great aunts used to wear when they were cleaning their house, when they used to do their dusting and vacuuming and stuff like that. It really did look like a house coat. You know, but is she really going for the frumpy Stepford wife look now? I have no idea. But, you know, and what amused me about it, now this is bitchy again, I can't help myself, can I? Um, she just looked effortlessly glamorous, one TikTok user wrote. I love her style. Like someone dressed for a Nancy Myers movie. <laughs> anyway, let me know while I have a sip. Let me know below what you thought of the Carolina Herrera. Um, now, I looked up how to pronounce that. It's not Carolina. It's Carolina. Carolina Herrera. Um, yes, her coat that Meghan and Harry wore to the art gallery opening on, uh, it was actually on the same evening, I think, that Catherine announced her uh, cancer diagnosis. But yes, effortlessly glamorous or house coat, brunch coat, doing the dusting vacuuming. You let me know down below. Sip. I'm going to turn this off now in case it is bothering you. Oh, oh, it's got three speeds. I nearly took off. Okay, we'll put that there. Oh, it's interrupting my easy display. I'll put it at the back. Okay, what else have we got to chat about? There's an infinite amount to talk about. Oh, yes. Now, this was a moving story. We've talked about the Catholic Church, so now we've got to talk about Church of England. Um, this was about vicars, retired vicars, actually getting a bit ripped off by the Church of England because they were offered interest-only uh, mortgages. And so they never got a chance to sort of own their homes. So they were paying off these interest only mortgages and they were set at about three or four percent. Well, no, they're at about three or four percent now, but when they were taken out, they're a lot lower. And evidently vicars, I was interested to read, they get 650 pounds approximately a month, which it's not a lot, is it? And these mortgages, the average interest only mortgage now for these, you know, houses that they're allowed to live in for their lifetime is about £400 a month now. So all these poor vicars, what are they going to do? So I think they should, you know, I think the Church, Church of England's very rich institution, as is the Catholic Church. I think they should look after their vicars. And I think they should look at how many payments, how many interest only payments these vicars made over like their, you know, 40, 50 year career. And I think they should credit it and give them that equity in the home. And I think they should either give them the choice to move and have the money as equity, sort of like in a super fund, or they should give them that ownership so that when they die, that it can be passed down, that equity can be passed down to their family. I think that's the only fair thing. I mean, who proposed interest-only loans? That's very dodgy, brothers, isn't it? I mean, it might have been so that the vicars could afford, you know, not become homeless, but it's still dodgy, brothers. Everyone knows that interest-only is dodgy unless you're doing it for investment purposes and you intend to sell it on in five years or whatever. But, you know, oh, I think, oh, I think they're going to have to, you know, rectify that situation for all the poor vicars. I love vicars um, because, you know, it, to me it always reminds me of a Miss Marple, you know, book, you know, and um, Agatha Christie book, you know, particularly the Miss Marple ones because she was always having the vicar to tea, wasn't she? And I just love love the vicars. It's sort of English novels and English crime thrillers because they're always so bumbly and naive and <laughs> not really sure what's going on. And usually the murderer's right under their nose and they had no idea. <laughs> and I just love all that sort of, you know, village life as displayed in Agatha Christie books. I think it's just so gorgeous, such a huge. Do you like all that stuff too? I do. I love it. And there's usually a maid, isn't there? A maid that also does work at the local tea house and um, comes in with the daily and she's always, you know, got a bruise or <laughs> she knows something or she disappears. It's just fascinating, fascinating. Or is found um, unalived underneath the clothesline. 
<laughs> I think I might have to read some Agatha Christie over the Easter break. I'm, I'm feeling the mood. I'm feeling the mood because we're getting quite a bit of rain where I am. So it's a cosy time. It's not as hot and it's a cosy time to sort of um, snuggle up. Oh, I took a photo and I'll put the photo up when before I put this up. And it's of Victoria Beckham and she's got one of those knee scooters that you kneel on and you can scoot around and they've got a basket. And in the story, they said it was her wine basket. <laughs> And evidently David Beckham paid £300 for her to get her little mobility scooter that she can kneel on. Well, my husband got me one when I broke my ankle. I was telling you last gossip how I broke my ankle and about the radiologist. And um, he didn't buy it for me, though. He didn't spend £300 on mine. He hired it. I think it was $7 a week from the mobility supply place. <laughs> which doesn't seem as posh. I did have a basket though, but it didn't think to put wine in it. <laughs> but it was great because you do get frustrated on crutches and it was great that, you know, if we wanted to go somewhere with the boys, I could sort of keep up. If we were going along sort of the esplanade along the beach or something, as long as I had that, I could keep up. I could push with my good leg and I could go along and I could carry all their paraphernalia in the basket because they were a lot younger when I broke my ankle. And um, yeah, so they're great. So if you ever are on crutches, go to one of those medical hire places because they actually do hire out those posh Victoria Beckham mobility scooters that you kneel on. You don't have to spend 300 pounds on it because I guess you're not going to need to use it again unless you're very unlucky <laughs> planning to break the other one or something. What else have I got here? Oh, yes. Now, this is juicy and I'll finish off with this one. We better have a sip because it's very, very juicy. I can feel my hair sort of fuzzing up. <laughs> with the humidity in this room, I dare look in the mirror. Sometimes I finish these gossips and I go off, you know, and then I clamp some myself in the mirror and I go, oh, no. <laughs> Oh, I wish I had to brush my hair. <laughs> it's just normal. Now, tell me what you think. We'll say sip first. Sip, sip. Now, I read this article and it was about Eugenie supposedly bringing Harry and William together because she loves them both so much and she cares about them so much. No, Eugenie. <laughs> Eugenie, no, no, just back off, leave it, leave it alone. As if William would want a call from Eugenie saying, how's Catherine? Oh, by the way, I think Harry's genuinely remorseful. He'd just like to make some contact with you. He doesn't want anything from you. He just wants to offer his support. No, no, not happening. Can you imagine the stress? of having hapless Harry back in your life? Can you imagine all the newspaper headlines? Can you imagine how much Meghan Markle would just feed off that contact and how little things would start to be slipped, start to be slipped? Actually, it did make me wonder, and you let me know down below, this is real gossipy gossip before bed, but I wondered about the true relationship between the Yorks and William and Catherine. I wondered about the true relationship, whether um, William really has much regard for Auntie Sarah. I know that he would have been close to his cousins growing up, but I think in latter years, um, I think that was destroyed because around 2011 to 2014, word has it in quite a few books, it's been documented that uh, Eugenie and Beatrice were quite uh, unwelcoming or a little bit looking down their nose at the commoner Catherine when she joined the royal family. And I imagine that William wouldn't have a short memory. So, and I do realise that in 2014, Catherine tried to sort of, uh, she, she went out of her way to put Beatrice and Eugenie in a good light. But we did see that clip where Eugenie at the church service sort of brushed past Catherine very, very rudely and made sure that she went first. You know, she was sort of stating where she stood. Um, so, yeah, hmm. I don't think that relationship is overly warm. So I don't think 
usually you'll be a very effective peacemaker because I don't think they probably trust you much either. <laughs> you let me know what you think down below and let me know if you think I'm being harsh and unfriendly and unkind because, I look, I can be that and I, I'll pull my head in if I get suitably admonished in the comments, I'll put my head in. Anyway, I think that's all I have to say. Um, I want to wish you all a very happy Easter. I hope that Easter Buddy comes on Sunday. I hope all of you, where it's a significant um, moment in your faith and your life and that you enjoy church and the celebration on Sunday, um, I hope everyone that's not into that just enjoys their break. And also, let me know down below, what are your traditions for Good Friday? In my family, when we're growing up, mum always made a beautiful smoked, um, I think it's haddock, is it? Uh, Kedgeri. And we always had that for Good Friday night. And, you know, that was sort of a tradition. And then sort of I'm too slack and lazy, so my boys just get fish and chips on Good Friday. <laughs> So it's fish and chips on Good Friday. So, you know, we'll queue up with the rest of them, get our fish and chips. Um, so let me know your traditions and what you do for Easter and whether you do Easter egg hunts for your grandkids or whether you did Easter egg hunts for your kids. We can't because of, of our little doggy. So um, we'll just have the, the Easter bunny will come, even though my boys are grown, the Easter bunny will come. That'll be on the breakfast table on Sunday morning. He leaves them on the breakfast table. So let me know and I hope you have a wonderful Easter, a really good break. Maybe stay off social media, stay off from all, away from all the cesspool that is social media and just enjoy yourself and eat lots and lots of chocolate. Okay, I'll see you again very soon. Well, next week actually. See ya. Bye. Love you all. Bye.